Okay, I think we are ready to start. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third conversation for the future of Europe. This year taking place in the framework of the Wednesday EGPP seminar series. For those of you who connect for the first time, my name is Lorenzo Cicchi. I am the EGPP coordinator and I will be chairing uh, today's session. It is a pleasure to see uh, a lot of familiar faces and some new ones for the conversation today led by Antoine Vaucher, titled Democratizing Europe. Democratizing Europe's Economic Government, the TDEM proposal of a transnational parliamentary assembly. Uh, as I said, the EGPP seminar series takes place on Wednesdays over the course of the whole academic year and combines uh, four different formats. We have research seminars, book presentations, seminars of the European Union Studies Working Group led by PhD researchers, and finally, the conversations for the future of Europe, which is the case of today's session. Now, unfortunately, we are still confined to our Zoom limbo, but hopefully we will go back to some sort of hybrid event with a combination of physical presence and online participation, if not for next week's session, later in spring for the last seminars of the academic year, which last until uh, mid-June approximately. Now, for the introductory acknowledgement, first of all, I would like to thank Brigitte Laffan for involving me in the organization of the conversations last year, which has proven to be very much enriching and stimulating for me. And Daniele Caramani for hosting the conversation this year as a sort of a special event uh, of the EGPP uh, Brown Bug Seminars. Then I would like to deeply thank Philip Van Parijs for his enthusiasm in co-organizing with me once again the conversation and I have to say, I very much look forward to finally do this again next year in person and possibly from the beautiful gardens of Villa Stefanoia. I also thank the speaker, Antoine Vaucher, and the discussants, Siana Timcheva and Joaquin Blatter, for having immediately accepted our invitation. And finally, let me acknowledge the support from our admin and comms team, Martina and Sara for the virtual logistics of this event, which as usual is flawless. Now, before I move on to some more practical issues of format, timing and technicalities, I leave the floor to Philippe, who will give some opening remarks, reinstating the spirit of the conversations, present today's topic and introduce the panelists. Thank you, Philippe, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Lorenzo. And um, yes, first uh, about the spirit of the conversations, which holds in fact in uh, two maxims. The first one consists in saying, don't just analyze, don't just criticize, but stick your neck out, make proposals and subject them to a no nonsense uh, discussion. And maxim number two, be bold. Don't hesitate uh, to be bold. Uh, of course, political feasibility needs to be taken into account, but it's not a parameter. It's something that can be shaped by public discussion, including about bold proposals. Usually like to cite uh, in support of this view, the end of Politikals Beruf uh, by Max Weber, but another sort of uh, quote in the same direction, which I also uh, like to uh, cite is uh, from uh, perhaps unexpected site Friedrich Hayek, who in uh, 1949 said, the main lesson which the true liberal must learn from the success of the socialists is that it was their courage to be utopian, which gained them the support of the intellectuals and thereby an influence on public opinion which is daily making possible what only recently seemed utterly remote. So don't hesitate to be bold, don't hesitate to be utopian, bearing in mind political feasibility, but also the malleability, the, uh, the shapeability of um, political opinion and thereby of political feasibility. This will be illustrated today with the bold TDEM proposal, which um, uh, Antoine presented in one of his publications as a real democratic transplant at the heart of uh, the new European power bloc that um, is formed by the Eurozone and its uh, current uh, organization. I won't uh, say I let uh, Antoine present uh, that proposal 
uh, in a minute, and I'll just quickly introduce the three uh, speakers who we uh, thank very much for having agreed to uh, introduce our discussion today. Uh, Antoine uh, Vaucher uh, is currently uh, Directeur de Recherche at the uh, CNRS, at the Centre Européen de Sociologie et Sciences Politiques, and he co-directs a master program on European public affairs at uh, uh, Paris uh, Sorbonne, the University of Paris uh, Sorbonne. Um, before that, he uh, graduated from uh, Sciences Po in Paris, has also master degrees in comparative politics and in public law from uh, the University of Paris en Sorbonne. He is an uh, uh, enfant de la maison uh, from the EUI because uh, he took his uh, doctorate at the European University uh, Institute in uh, 2000, having, after having spent a number of years uh, in Florence. Um, then he moved on to become a uh, chercheur at the CNRS, but uh, returned uh, to Florence uh, to EUI for a, a couple of years and also held uh, visiting uh, positions in uh, quite a few places, including recently in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, at, uh, and in Italy, uh, at Louis and at uh, Bocconi. Among his publications, I'll just mention a book, which um, also published in English uh, later on, on uh, l'union par le droit, uh, l'invention d'un programme institutionnel pour uh, l'Europe, uh, but I shall mention uh, above all what is uh, directly relevant uh, for uh, today's um, event. He published uh, a book um, uh, with uh, Le Seuil in France, uh, also available in English, uh, on uh, Democratiser l'Europe in 2014, which was no doubt one of the uh, sources of inspiration of uh, what became then the TDEM proposal. And in 2017, uh, together with Thomas Piketty, uh, Guillaume uh, Sacrist and uh, Stéphanie Hennet, he published uh, in the French, Pour un traité de démocratisation de l'Europe. So uh, that's the TDEM uh, proposal published in several lang languages. And that became then also in 2019, um, a book published by Harvard University Press, but supplemented by a number of uh, critiques that were made of the proposals and also the rejoinder by uh, the authors. Again, um, so uh, Antoine wrote the, the first chapter, but it's uh, co-authored, the proposal is co-authored with Thomas Piketty, uh, Guillaume Sacrist, and uh, Stéphanie uh, Annette. So uh, he's no doubt one of the main thinkers, if not the chief thinker behind the TDEM proposal. And so we are very uh, pleased to uh, welcome him in that uh, capacity. So as one of those who stick their necks out in order to make a proposal and to get it sh shot at uh, successfully or not by other people in order to improve it. Uh, next, uh, we'll have uh, Siane Timsheva. So uh, our concern also in these uh, conversations all along has been to make room for young voices, for uh, people who are still um, uh, at the PhD level, as uh, uh, Siana is. Uh, she uh, took a bachelor degree from the University of National and World Economy in Sofia in um, 2012, then came uh, to uh, Switzerland, or went to Switzerland, uh, to do a um, master in comparative and international studies at uh, the Federal Institute of Technology uh, in uh, Zurich. And since 2017, she is uh, preparing a doctorate at the Chair of Comparative Politics at the University of Zurich with a dissertation relevant to our topic on uh, supranational ideological divisions in international parliamentary institutions, in particular, no doubt, the uh, European Parliament. And uh, finally, Joachim uh, Blätter, is uh, currently a professor at uh, the University of Lucerne in the Department of uh, Political Science, which uh, he's been chairing uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, before that, uh, he studied mainly at uh, the University of Constance uh, in uh, Germany. He did um, 
undergraduate studies in social sciences, master degree in political science. Uh, he prepared the doctorate there, but uh, which he submitted at uh, the Martin Luther University in Halle Wittenberg and did his habilitation again uh, in uh, Constance, then moved to uh, the Netherlands where he was, uh, he taught for a couple of years at Erasmus University and then uh, went uh, to uh, Luther. He published several books, a number of them uh, on methodological uh, methods, on, on um, uh, qualitative uh, methods in uh, political science. Published his habilitation, which was about uh, uh, governance uh, in metropolitan areas in the United States. And then I just mentioned uh, two articles uh, by him recent, directly relevant to our topic. One uh, was on democratic deficits in Europe, the overlooked exclusivity of nation states and the positive role of the European Union. And then uh, one in a uh, 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 paper that was published in the uh, Global CIT, uh, on the Global CIT website that is uh, directed by uh, Reinhard Bauböck on, uh, with a number of comments on this proposal. We'll return to that in a few minutes under the title, let me vote in your country and let you vote in mine, a proposal for transnational democracy. Another bold proposal about which we'll hear more in a few minutes. But first then uh, back to uh, Lorenzo and then we'll hear our three uh, guests. Thank you, Philip. So as for the format and timing, uh, uh, Antoine has 15 to 20 minutes for situating and pleading the TDM proposal. Then we have eight to 10 minutes each to Siana and Joachim in this order for the discussion and also counter proposal, as I may say. In the remaining time, I will moderate in the best of my capacities, the Q&A and the discussion. Now, if there are plenty of hands up already after the discussion's input, and usually this is the case, I will open up the floor to the other participants uh, right away. Housekeeping and technicalities, the usual applies. So make sure that your microphone is muted by default in order to avoid background noise. And remember to unmute it when you speak or have a question. If you can, I invite everybody to keep their video on in order to retain a feeling of presence and community despite being, as I said, in our Zoom limbo. If you want to ask a question, it is preferable that you use the raise of hand button, which you should find at the bottom of your chat box. If you cannot find it or it doesn't work, which is sometimes the case, simply write down your name in the public chat. In both cases, wait for my acknowledgement. Remember to unmute yourself and then speak up. In any case, please refrain from writing the actual question in the chat. It is better to engage in a, in a proper conversation. If you have a pressing technical issue, please open up a private chat either with me, with Martina Popova, or with the EGPP account. You have Sara behind it. And finally, I will send a private message to the speaker when he has five minutes left, and to the discussants when they have two minutes to conclude. So without further ado, Antoine, the floor is yours. Hello, um, uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Lorenzo. Thank you, Philippe, for the introduction and for inviting me over to to this uh, to this seminar. <clears throat> I'm actually in Florence right now, uh, um, although in quarantine, uh, waiting to climb to the hill um, very soon, probably tomorrow. So I, I hope to be able to meet some of you uh, in the coming uh, weeks. So. Um, thank you for uh, for inviting me for uh, to present this uh, treaty for the democratization of Europe. It's already four years old in a way because it was initially uh, conceived um, with uh, Thomas Piketty, Stéphanie Hennet, and Guillaume Sacrist in the context of the French presidential campaign, um, and then uh, somehow uh, complemented in the context of the campaign for the European elections of the European the election of the European Parliament. Um, in a nutshell, the, the, objectives were, the objectives were two. One was to bring back uh, a representative politics at the core of the debate on economic government of Europe. An economic government of Europe that had and is still massively dominated by executives, whether European or national. And I think the next generation EU plan is reinforcing even further 
this tendency, uh, this executive tendency um, in uh, the government of economic policies in Europe. So the Treaty for the Democratization of, of Europe is thought, uh, I mean, creates uh, and suggests to create, it's probably the courage of utopia that Philip was referring to uh, um, earlier, a, a transnational parliament composed of delegations of national MPs and of European MPs uh, in charge of counterbalancing this executive slope um, uh, of the economic uh, government uh, in Europe. The second objective um, was still is to bring back issues of public investments, public goods uh, in a context that was at the time uh, dominated by uh, austerity and, and tendencies to, um, uh, to bring, um, to marginalize in a way the issue of public investment. So the, the, what we've come out uh, in relation to that is a proposal of a budget a budget for public investments that uh, should complement the actual uh, EU budget and, uh, and uh, focus on public goods of European scale, as we can call them, um, ecological transition, issues of migration, uh, higher education, et cetera, and uh, with a budget that would have to be financed on the base of European taxes uh, on highest revenues and patrimonies and on uh, biggest uh, polluters, very uh, briefly sketched. So, I mean, there uh, we, we've published some some books and uh, and blogs and a number of articles explaining more in in detail. What I would like to to do today is uh, probably first uh, give elements on the general approach, how we somehow thought about framing the methodology, if you want, of uh, underlying the the proposal. Uh, the fabric of the proposal to a certain extent. A second point would be um, on our analysis of the context on which, in a way, the proposal is grounded. And third, uh, the expected political dynamics that we, uh, I, that we think that such a treaty and a budget would actually trigger. So in terms of general approach, um, our methodology was uh, somehow to start from the, the, the constat uh, of the impasse of, of, the, of the current uh, debate on Europe on the reform of European treaties. And this ever since, I would say, 2005. And you know, the way uh, the constitutional project was halted. And ever since, the sort of a fear of reforming treaties uh, fear uh, that is, of course, uh, based on the fact that it requires unanimity, it requires a long process of a rewriting um, and of debates, and in a way, the current difficulties of identifying what is the actual object of the Conference for the Future of Europe that started last week or yesterday um, is in part still the legacy of this difficulty of thinking about the reform of Europe ever since 2005. And uh, an important element of our proposal to move beyond the impasse um, is that this uh, treaty, uh, this budget could be somehow initiated by any group of countries, not necessarily by the 27 initially, but any group of countries that want to um, engage in public investments together and, in, and, and build uh, uh, common taxes uh, um, at the transnational level um, would actually be able to trigger movement uh, that potentially could then progressively um, be of interest for other countries and initiate a sort of spillover effect. Um, so, in a way, France and Germany have started, uh, but very modestly, when two years ago they have created uh, together a Franco-German parliament, which has been existing for two or three years now, which meets twice a year. Of course, it has no powers. It doesn't draft a budget, um, not to say, uh, um, you know, uh, raise taxes, but still, I think there is something of that, that, you know, a couple of countries or more can actually initiate the process without just uh, 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 organizing a, 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 a sort of general 
conference uh, on the reform of, of treaties that we know uh, would be uh, long and difficult and with a result that is quite um, uncertain. That's for the first element of met method. Then on the format, um, against the, again, the courage of uh, being an utopian um, led us in a way uh, to come with uh, something that may look pretentious is to come out with a, a, a proposal of treaty and a proposal of budget. Um, but I think the idea is to avoid a discussion uh, on the reform of the EU that, that remains too abstract, that remains too vague commitment to the democratic governance uh, or um, other sort of vague terms or double discourses on European issues. And the advantage of drafting a treaty and drafting a budget is that somehow you position yourself in two critical debates. The first debate is about distribution of power, horizontal or vertical distribution of power, and somehow you position, you know, how you view, uh, you know, the position, for example, of, of, of representative democracy in the governance uh, of uh, economic policies. And then on a second axis, which of course is the, the axis of redistribution of wealth, which is another critical axis um, with the budget, because the budget, of course, is something in terms of policy priorities and in terms of taxing. And of course, who are the social or the classes that uh, um, would have to be uh, taxed uh, um, in, um, more or less. So that, that was the idea of the format. And um, the, the second idea relatedly was to connect debates on policies and debates on institutions. I think uh, too, most often the, the two discussions are quite disconnected. Most often we have, particularly on economic governance, we have the economists that are, you know, come out with a lot of ideas on how to fix the Euro and how to fix the Eurozone and engineering a number of, um, you know, how it is suboptimal and how it could be made uh, optimal. But they remain very technocratic uh, debates and apolitical in a way. Um, and on the other side, there is a whole debate on institutional engineering. Um, but it's also often on a separate pla plane than the issue of policies. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with the idea of finding magic ballots that would actually change the equilibrium of uh, EU institutions, but in a way, uh, uh, somehow uh, unconnected to issues of, of, uh, of policies. And I think this uh, is why it was useful to be together with economists and lawyers and political scientists all together, because in a way that made it possible, because I like the technicity on economic issues, and I guess Thomas Piketty uh, likes the technicity on uh, issues of, uh, of political institutions in, in the context of the EU. And, and, and I think uh, uh, the, the interdisciplinarity of the project uh, is, uh, is, in my mind, uh, key in, uh, in, in what we've uh, been trying to do. Uh, that is for the, the first point on the methodology in general. The second point is what sort of diagnosis do we have or on which we are granting our proposal? Um, our uh, general um, diagnosis um, is that I've, the EU is somehow hardly recognizable today, uh, 25 years or more after, or 30 years almost after the Maastricht Treaty and the, uh, the creation of uh, the Euro. Um, I think the center of gravity of the EU, and many scholars say so, um, um, have been profoundly rebalanced over the past 30 years. And one of the pull, the main pull of change in the gravity has been the, the euro, of course, you know, the policies that have been uh, uh, created to save the euro, to stabilize the euro, to, uh, um, uh, further, to, to help the eurozone be relaunched after the current crisis, etc. So the center of gravity of the EU has moved in a lot, a lot around um, uh, the government of the euro. And uh, in the name of the government of the stability of the euro, uh, as you know, a number of uh, treaties, policies have piled up in a way 
and particularly to face the crisis over the past 15 years. And what is uh, emerging in a way of the European semester, of the stability pact, uh, of uh, even the banking union, and, and even the next generation EU plan, what is emerging in a way, I think, is uh, what we call a European government of national economic policies. Uh, that is uh, a set of instruments that are uh, uh, aim, that aim at um, uh, the coordination, the surveillance, uh, and in some cases the sanction of uh, the the policies of national governments vis-à-vis um, uh, -vis the economic objectives of uh, the euro. Um, and one of the characteristic of course, of this European government of national economic policies is that it has a lot of effects on national social and fiscal pacts. Uh, the fact that uh, through the recommendations, um, uh, through the many meetings of the Eurogroup, uh, there is a, a, a set of um, um, policies that are decided and that of course, affect uh, the way governments can actually lead, social policies uh, can lead um, um, investment, public investment, uh, uh, retirement plans, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is new in the sense that EU policies have a clear and direct uh, uh, consequences on uh, the way national social and fiscal pact are uh, decided, governed, and, and discussed. Um, and, 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 a, and, and a third element of this new government um, is that it developed somewhere in between the European and the national. It combines elements of supranationality and elements of intergovernmentalism. There is the Euro com European Commission playing a key role, of course, in the European semester, but there is the Eurogroup of ministers of finance, which is meeting, uh, and, and all the preparatory committees of the, European, of the Eurogroup, as you know, that uh, bring together uh, what I would call the financiers, the public financiers of Europe, uh, treasuries, central bankers, uh, high civil servants of DG ECFIN, and they make up a new uh, a new elite, which is the you know the financiers in a way um, uh, that um, socialize in uh, these um, uh, settings uh, such as uh, uh, the Eurogroup. So it's it's a, a government that is developing somehow in between the European and the national. Um, some could call it transnational, but it has a common point. It has, a, uh, it has a, a, a characteristic, which is that it develops in large part at good distance from parliaments, from all parliaments, European or national. Um, and it's, some, it's, not, it's, it's actually very difficult for parliaments to position themselves in uh, this uh, new context, uh, uh, even for the next generation EU plan, you know, the, there's a sort of dialogue uh, between the European parliament um, and uh, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the the Council and the European Commission, but but there but there is little capacity for for parliaments to actually decide or co-decide or veto or sanction or or actually uh, um, really uh, transform uh, the plan uh, itself. And it's the same, of course, for national uh, parliaments which somehow uh, uh, intervene often too late uh, and are consulted essentially. Um, what up uh, for uh, the general, um, I would say a diagnosis, which is that there is indeed a new center of power that emerges um, uh, that is some, uh, around the economic government of Europe with many re redistributive consequences in, in national uh, democracies but very little uh, capacity for parliamentary, for representative politics, let's say, to have a say or to make a difference in, um, in, this, uh, in this context. So I will now move to the third point, which is 
well, the, 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 the questions and the TEDEM, uh, I would say solutions or proposals uh, from uh, starting from, from there. The, the general question I would say that, that somehow come out of this diagnosis and their general question, I think that political science is continuously raising um, uh, in the context of the European Union is First, how can we reconnect economic, economic regulation to representative politics? Um, second, relatedly, how can we democratize this intermediary sphere where most intermediary, I mean, in between uh, the EU and, and the national, this intermediary sphere, to quote Luc van Midlau, that's his term actually, uh, where most of Europe's economic government is now developing. It's really in between and not in one or the other level where you could somehow uh, uh, consider that uh, this policy or this government could uh, you know, uh, be uh, put. Um, so, and uh, relatedly last question, how can we conceive of political institutions that are able to organize transnational compromises of policies. Um, should we think that, the, can we think that institutions such as the Eurogroup or such as uh, summits of uh, heads of state is enough or is fit to organize transnational compromises with redistributive consequences? Or do we need other types of institutions such as a parliament that would be uh, more fit to organize, again, these transnational political compromises that are not just intergovernmental compromises, but are transnational compromises across countries, certainly, but also across social classes. So in that sense, um, intergovernmental settings, such as the Eurogroup of the European Summit, uh, may not be the, uh, uh, the, the, most, the most fitted um, uh, political uh, institution. And we know that uh, from the negotiations even of the next generation EU, that these settings end up by creating, you know, more conflict in a way, uh, by creating stereotypes on who the Italians are, who the Dutch are, the frugals against the which of course is um, um, uh, um, not a very stable way to uh, politically build uh, uh, compromises. So, uh, and, and I'm really finishing, I know I have two minutes, I think, um, uh, Lorenzo, but it's still okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, what the TEDEM uh, does is um, to offer to, um, to, to create a, a permanent seat, a permanent seat for transnational politics, a permanent seat where transnational deliberation is possible and where transnational compromises um, uh, about these, this economic government, these economic policies can be uh, uh, created. Uh, in a way, the view is to overcome the structural division between the European and its set of institutions and the national and its own set of political institutions. Um, it's not the first proposal, of course, to, do, to be doing so, but in a certain sense, uh, I think it's an idea whose time has come, um, uh, the idea of a transnational parliament, precisely because of the evolution of economic government of the, of the Euro, which is again, is very much taking place in this intermediary and gray zone, if you want, uh, uh, intermediary uh, sphere. So what are the expected dynamics from, from this, this parliament? Two points, and I, I, I just leave it for the discussion. Um, one, one of the expected dynamics is that it would allow um, um, na national parliamentary elections to turn into European elections at the same time, because when you would designate national MPs who would take part to the transnational assembly, then you would de designate MPs that somehow would uh, also participate to the, to the decision on, on European policy. So in a way, 
The idea is to scale up uh, national representative politics uh, by um, uh, uh, forcing it into uh, debating Europe. Second point, um, I think uh, one of the dynamics that is expected is that since you uh, put into the game the oppositions and not only the majorities, because when you create a, a transnational assembly, you don't just have the majority uh, in the national delegation of MPs, you also have the opposition. And that's why you want a large parliament because it would create large delegations and a variety of parties represented. Then you get a different dynamics than intergovernmental summits because it's not just majority with majority. It's a, a, a variety of possible uh, coalitions that can be built also with the oppositions of the in the different countries. So I, I leave it here. Again, uh, it's, it's also a reflection on, on the structure of European parliamentarism and, uh, and, and a way maybe to, again, overcome um, the, 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 the ritual, the traditional opposition between uh, the institutions of the national and the institutions of the European, which in a way are not fit with, for the, with the, the current uh, challenge. Merci de votre écoute. Uh, thank you, Antoine, also for staying uh, well in time. Uh, so now, without further ado, Siana, the floor is, all, is yours for eight to 10 minutes. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in the discussion of this inspiring proposal to democratize Europe. I think that this is a very innovative and well thought over proposal. It um, identifies correctly many of the weaknesses of the present institutional design of the European Union and the serious need for a reform. The proposed TDEM treaty has a great deal of merits and that deserve attention. And Antoine here has pointed them out in his presentation. I will therefore talk about the, um, some of the caveats that could potentially weaken the case for the adoption of the treaty and come up with some amendment. I'm going to discuss the proposed institutional design of the Transnational European Assembly and the possible implications of that institutional design. And in my discussion, I will also concentrate on both um, normative and practical aspects of the proposal. So my first concern is about the adoption of the treaty. On the one hand, its purpose is to weaken or at least counterbalance the executive and national alignments by creating a legislative body. On the other hand, it is actually the member states that have to approve its adoption and in this way give up some of their powers in a domain where national sovereignty has prevailed. And I think that in order for the treaty to be adopted, pressure should actually come not just from the general public or from academia, but from the national parliaments themselves. Only if there is enough political will coming from the national parliaments for such project, there could be a chance, chance for the proposal to be adopted. Um, it would require a lot of coordinated efforts between national parliaments. And therefore, uh, my first suggestion would be strengthening the institutions for interparliamentary dialogue between the national parliaments um, as the first necessary step before the creation of such a transnational assembly. Second, although I agree that national parliaments have to be involved more in European level uh, decision making, creating an assembly with the majority of the MPs delegated indirectly from national parliaments is sort of a step back instead of a step forward. We basically had such an assembly before the introduction of direct elections in 79. And the lessons, the main lessons learned from that experience are first, double mandates are not effective and we cannot expect an MP to be equally involved on the domestic and the European front. And second, indirect elections create a serious legitimacy concern. In general, indirect elections are for powerless and purely consultative um, international parliaments, whereas the transnational assembly would dispose of significant redistributive powers. My third argument is about the duration of the national parliamentarian's mandate. It is not specified in the treaty how long 
that ma mandate would be. Will there be new national delegations following each national election? If that is the case, this would mean a very high turnover of national MPs, which in turn will make the cooperation within the assembly even harder to achieve. The two types of MPs, the national and the European ones, won't have enough opportunities to interact, to socialize with each other, and to develop supranational thinking and alignments, um, common purpose, if you will. So given that we already know that there is hostility between national parliaments and the European parliament, how can we expect representatives from these institutions to suddenly cooperate? Which brings me to my fourth argument. Um, the TDEM treaty also does not specify how many sessions the transnational assembly will hold. It appears that it is going to be a sort of an ad hoc assembly with a very limited scope, but at the same time, immensely important task, namely the adoption of a budget that is four times larger than the current EU budget. So I wonder from where the new transnational European assembly would derive its legitimacy. I imagine that it would be even less popular among the general public than the European Parliament, considering that the European Parliament exists for 70 years now, and despite the many efforts to popularize it, uh, most people are not interested in it and don't know about the way it functions. So if this transnational assembly exists for a single purpose, but yet yields such immense power as the redistribution of such substantial resources, Realistically, the chances are very low uh, for the proposal to see the light of the day as it is right now. Another concern I had um, is the number, the number of parliamentarians. Um, the proposed assembly has 400 members and that's a rather low number for a supranational parliament that in the best case scenario would represent 500 million people. Um, in most, it most probably also means that not all parliamentary represented national parties can send parliamentarians to the assembly, which can be very problematic, democratically speaking. Um, moreover, if the rule is strictly proportional, proportional representation as the TDEM treaty stipulates, um, instead of digressive representation, this would mean that small states would be greatly underrepresented, which will uh, in turn lead them to have even less incentives to join the assembly. And finally, and most importantly, um, the TDEM proposal seems to assume that national parliamentarians will, first of all, have the European interest instead of the narrow national interest at heart. Second, that they will consider the four policy areas of the proposed budget, so knowledge, environment, reception of migrants and taxation also as a priority in their respective states. And the third and most problematic assumption is that they will hold progressive uh, political views. These four policy areas in the budget are connected to progressive ideologies and clearly associated with the political left. However, the national and the EP parliamentarians will be from the entire political spectrum um, including from radical right national parties. So such MPs will definitely not vote in favor of allocating more resources for such policies, even if you could convince them that the money will be coming back to their home country. So I think that if national and European parliaments are set together for an ad hoc parliamentary session, what would happen is that instead of political divisions to form based on ideologies, the national parliamentarians would feel like they have to defend the national interest and would probably organize into national delegations instead, instead of into political group, groups. And in effect, this means that they will defend the interests of nation states and not of socialists or liberals, which um, would defeat the purpose of the proposal at the end. If, if the parliamentarians organize according to their nationality, the new assembly would simply replicate the existing national divisions that the proposal actually attempts to counter. Um, so even if for some reason they organize according to their political affiliation, you would still need a majority of left-leaning MPs to adopt such a 
budget. Um, and given the current political constellations in the member states, I don't see many potential supporters um, of this proposal. So thanks for your attention, and I hope that my comments are helpful um, to you. Okay, thank you, Siana, also for staying perfectly in time and for the systematic discussion, full of very uh, practical and, and uh, logical points, which is really what helps us to, to shape this discussion. So now the floor to uh, Joachim, and for the rest of the audience, if you want to already signal that you want to uh, join, jump in the discussion with a question or a comment, you can already start raising up your, raising up your hand or writing down, down your name in the, in the public chat. So, Joachim, the floor is yours for, again, eight to ten minutes. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to comment on this exciting proposal to democratize Europe, which is, according to the authors of the proposal, strongly shaped by the intergovernmental and technocratic form of decision-making within the Eurogroup. I begin by giving due praise to what I perceive as a very important contribution to a crucial debate. I then turn to two concerns that I have with a proposal that puts redistributive taxation policies and a new assembly consisting of members of national parliament and the European Parliament center stage. I conclude by pointing to some core elements of an alternative proposal that gives people both in their role as collective actors and in their role as individual citizens and political parties a more prominent role in democratizing Europe. Rather than, a, uh, than as an alternative to Antoine's proposal, I understand my proposal as a necessary complement. So I start with praise. First, I congratulate Antoine and his colleagues for offering a concrete reform proposal, something that most academics shy away from when getting involved in political debates. The proposal is secondly very clear and spe specifies the policy instruments and the institutions that are supposed to democratize Europe, or more precisely, the Euro governance structure. Next, I see it as a big advantage that the proposal builds on existing institutions and that vanguard countries could start implementing it without requiring a full-fledged treaty reform. Furthermore, I fully agree with the claim that we have to overcome the national framing of distributional and redistributional issue that is the consequence of the dominant intergovernmental form of governance in Europe, and that we have to stimulate political debates which focus on the right levels and means of distribution, redistribution between individuals, social groups, economic cooperation, classes. Finally, in contrast to very fashionable ideas to install new kinds of representative institutions, think about Emmanuel Macron's uh, proposal to replicate the citizen assembly idea on the European level. I very much applaud that the proposal builds on existing representative institutions, national parliaments and the EU parliament. There are many reasons for such a stance. The main reason being that parliaments, in contrast to citizen assemblies, have important function concerning both democratic will formation and democratic decision making thereby linking these two core functions to democratic, in democratic processes. As much as I agree with some of the central tenets, I would like to point to two problems. The first problem has to do with the proposal's focus on distributional issues, redistribution, and its relative ignorance of issues of recognition. This becomes clear to, just, to give just one example on how the issue of migration is portrayed. Migrants, in contrast to what the proposal implies, are not primarily, primarily perceived and debated as a financial burden. Public discourse in most countries frame migration primarily as a threat to established cultures and to the in-groups of domestic labor markets. Therefore, the solution lies not in burden sharing, but in finding the right balance between, on one hand side, recognizing the right of state peoples to regulate immigration, socioeconomic integration, and political inclusion, and recognizing basic human rights and mobility rights of individuals on the other hand. Furthermore, the EU must accept, and to a certain degree uh, at least, um, that the search for the right balance ends up in different regulations across its member states. 
Second, I understand the institutional core of the proposal as an acknowledgement that in the EU, we have to recognize two different kinds of principles, the individual persons, the, in, the Europeans, and collective state peoples, the nations. This insight acts as the argumentative ground for conceptualizing the European Assembly as a mix between members of the EU Parliament and members of national parliaments. Nevertheless, as much as I praise that such a new assembly would build on existing parliaments, I have strong doubts whether it would really be able to fulfill the envisioned function, the reconnecting the rulers and the ruled within the European multi-level system. First and foremost, I fear that it would, it would be very easy for populists to portray it as another form of a transnational collusion among political elites. Furthermore, and here I build on what has been said just before, as long as the national parliaments and parties are accountable only to national constituencies, it is very likely that their inclusion in an envisioned European assembly leads to a structuration of political conflicts and cleavages that is closer to the national framings that dominate within the institutions of executive intergovernmentalism than to the competition between ide ideological camps and party families that has taken root in the European Parliament. Overall, the proposal suffers from two weaknesses. First, in its policy dimension, it looks too much like a classic socialist or social democratic program, which makes it difficult to get other ideological groupings or parties on board. Second, the proposed institutional solution is too elitist for providing an appropriate answer to the populist challenge. And it does not provide political parties enough incentives to develop transnational programs, activities, and structures. In order to overcome these problems, an alternative solution might be expedient. I have to acknowledge that state, we have to acknowledge, I claim, that state peoples, the nations, and the nation states are and will remain the backbones of democratic self-determination in Europe. At the same time, we have to give individual citizens a more active role in the transnationalization of democracy in Europe. Finally, we have to make democratization proposals attractive for all kinds of ideological groupings and political parties. How can we do that? First, European state peoples should explicitly constitutionalize what is already emerging, although it's, it stays almost unnoticed, a system of horizontally overlapping state demoi. States increasingly, increasingly tolerate dual or multiple citizenships, partly as an un inside, unintended side effect of the emancipation of women, and at the same time, they make voting from abroad easier. In consequence, we have a growing part of the population that can vote in more than one country. European democracies should not try to suppress the use of multiple voting rights, but they should, but they should explicitly constitutionalize these rights and grant it to all their citizens, not just to the mobile ones and their descendants. In consequence, European states should sign a joint declaration of interdependence and grant their citizens the status of consociated citizens based on the principle of reciprocity. This status comes with voting rights in national elections. Second, state parliaments should build on an existing trend to reserve a limited number of seats for representatives of people who do not, who do not, who do not live on the territory of the state. Currently, this trend is limited to include representatives of non-resident -nation, non nationals. It could and should be expanded to include representatives of consociated citizens. Third, after such a transnational expansion of the national electorate and the national parliament has taken place, national parties have an incentive to take the perspectives and interests of consociated citizens into account, not only when they debate and take decisions in national parliaments and in transnational assemblies, but also when they campaign and thereby participate in national will formation. I believe that the transnationalization of national electorates and elections does a better job in getting where the proponents of TDEM want us to take. A system in which national elections get Europeanized that allows transnational party alliances to present alternative options for dealing with joint problems. 
My proposal has the same advantages as, as the TDEM proposal. A few Vanguard states could start implementing it without uh, requiring a treaty reform. Like the TDEM proposal, it builds on existing forms of representation. Nevertheless, it is based on, a re on recent transformations of state demoi and parliamentarian representations and not on a problematization of an important transform transformation of European governance. Therefore, I would perceive the two proposals as complementary. Nevertheless, for a stimulating debate, we might not only focus on the different backgrounds, but also on the different visions that are implied by these two quite concrete proposals. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Joachim, for managing to squeeze in less than 10 minutes uh, your intervention with the double hat of the discussant and also of the uh, alternative uh, proposal uh, that you just uh, delineated. So uh, I would say let's get already to the discussion. Let's open up the floor for discussion and we'll get uh, a couple of interventions. The first one from Philippe Amparais and the second from Elie Michel. And then after that, we will go back uh, uh, first to uh, Antoine and then possibly also to the, to the other panelists if some of the interventions also refer to the, the second alternative proposal by uh, Joachim. But thank you very much already to the panelists for the great start of the discussion. Uh, Philippe, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, very stimulating input from all three of you. Um, I'll have a, a substantive question, but which can be handled at, at a later stage, which uh, I would be interested in having the reaction of each of the three panelists to another idea, which is the idea of the now familiar of the transnational lists, uh, so the EU-wide constituency defended, for example, by Alberto Alemano, who was one of our speakers last time. So each of you may have a, a strong view on that. It would be interesting to throw it into the debate. But my, my urgent uh, question is uh, uh, really for uh, Antoine, if uh, you could then, um, as a prelude to answering in particular to uh, Siana's very good series of uh, questions, uh, if you could specify, be a bit more precise about uh, the, the proposal as a reminder for all of us, uh, that is, um, namely, how many uh, at this stage, maybe you've changed your view since the initial proposal, so how many national parliamentarians would join uh, the, uh, the Euro MPs to form this uh, assembly? Uh, then uh, how would that be chosen by each, uh, within each of the national parliaments? Uh, how proportional uh, would uh, their representation be, huh? given that even in the European Parliament, which is bigger now, there is a, 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 a digressive representation depending on the size of the country. And then how uh, big of a burden, uh, additional work burden, will it be for these national MPs to take part in the uh, European uh, Parliament? So, See Anna's question about uh, how many meetings uh, will there be? The, all these national parliamentarians have their own job as members of national parliament. So how much more will they need to do uh, either in Strasbourg or in, in Brussels as part of this additional job in order to get a proper focus on, on the proposals and its practical difficulties? I think it's important to, to get uh, this uh, clearly on our minds also. Okay, thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, Eli? Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot for the, <clears throat> for the great talk and the, the proposal in itself. And I have a question that uh, also seems to be, I mean, following the, the previous question that seems to be of, of interest to, to most people, the idea of elections or at least the selection process uh, for this, uh, this assembly. And, and I think it's a point that, that Siana made and, and I'd like to come back to it, which is the how problematic indirect elections uh, can be. Um, and I understand that the, the TDEM proposal has an ambition of, of sort of citizen empowerment, uh, but, and as Joachim said, like reconciling the ruled and the rulers is uh, maybe not uh, best done through indirect elections. So if I understand the, the process as you describe it, the, 
you turn national elections into European elections because you would be voting for both at the same time. You would be voting both for your national parliament and for um, this uh, Euro assembly at the same time. Now, I would say that that's probably a, 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 in a way disappointing because you would want to have transnational accountability for uh, transnational governance. If you have a transnational governance level, you would, and that would be also going, I think, in the lines of, of what Joachim says, that you need a transnational uh, uh, body of citizens then to uh, be, to rank accountable uh, democratic body, uh, an elected democratic body. So really the, the, the question there would be, by doing this, are, would you not even be making sort of European level elections even more second order than European elections already are, where European elections are already, you know, just a reflection of the national mood that is having, you know, um, uh, individual European elections separated from national processes. And then by making it just the Follow up of national elections, isn't there a risk that it becomes an even more, uh, yeah, even more second order and then even less, um, you know, decreasing accountability processes uh, between the, the governing structures and, and citizens? Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Eli. I have already some other questions, but maybe we have enough already uh, food for uh, discussion. So let's go back to Antoine. And after that, maybe we will collect two questions from Adriane Ritier and Calypso. And then we will go back to again to the panelists and maybe include what also uh, Philip has suggested as uh, let's say the third alternative proposal and have a round of discussions also with the uh, two discussants. So Antoine, back to you. Okay, well, thank you uh, for all the, the difficult questions and um, I'm not sure I will be able to answer all of them also because uh, to some extent, <clears throat> um, yeah, the, 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 there are many, I mean, there are many sub questions or, 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 or sub discussions uh, to be, to, to, you know, to, 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 to have and that's that that makes it very, you know, sort of big umbrella this uh, of debates. Um, but 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 thank you, uh, particularly to uh, Siana and, and and Joachim. Um, just directly starting on Joachim's uh, proposal, which which I think is 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 not only interesting but also complementary um, with the TEDEM uh, approach. So the, the idea of um, uh, of this uh, transnational assembly is to have 80% of members of parliament and uh, so delegations from national parliaments and 20% uh, from uh, the European parliament. And in, in a way that relates to your, to your proposal, Joachim, I think, because in a, in a way that is the idea that 20% um, uh, is somehow the, also the part of European society that is uh, binational or mobile or uh, somehow Europeanized, and and to that part of Europe also is uh, somehow needs to be represented. Not just because it needs to be represented, but also because it has a sort of a steering role to play in a transnational assembly by somehow pushing national parliamentarians to think in a European way and to think in the framework of EU institutions because they are precisely already socialized to EU issues uh, or to European way of framing problems. So, I mean, the idea of having uh, this 20% is not just a sort of, you know, um, just a guess. I think it corresponds to a share of European society to, in a way, and it corresponds to a specific ability that members of the European Parliament have in framing uh, issues in terms of, of, um, of European uh, issues. And in, in, in that sense, they could, you know, this encounter, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is interesting and can have socializing effect on the, on the dynamic of the, um, of the transnational assembly. So, of course, uh, as uh, Sienna was saying, that there, there has already been a transnational uh, assembly. There is still actually one at the Conseil d'Europe, and there was one before uh, '79. Uh, there's, there was a big difference, I think, um, because there was there were parliaments with 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 no powers. I mean, to put it a little bit bluntly, but I mean, 
no uh, powers in terms of, uh, or very little powers in terms of legislation, in terms of budget. I mean, this, uh, this to them, in a way, is centered on the idea of having a parliament that matters. And, and, and I think, you know, you mobilize MPs when they're, they understand that there is something to redistribute uh, through, a parliament, uh, through a, 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 a parliamentary deliberation and decision. And, and of course, part of, the, so, you know, part of the dynamic is based on the fact that precisely it's, it's a parliament that, uh, that has powers um, that no European parliament has had so far, uh, particularly in the field of economic uh, uh, governance. So in a way, that's, that's one, of the, one, of, one, of, one of the answers. So, so then, of course, Again, to see to Sienna and um, um, the, the 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 question of um, the, the fact that there would be um, a sort of uh, you know sort of complexity given the fact that elect national elections don't happen at the same time, all of them, but uh, in different moments, and therefore the idea of getting a competence of on EU issues. Would be difficult because there is there would be a continuous change of the composition of the of that transnational assembly. So this is a very concrete issue, of course difficult. I'm not sure I have uh, good answers to that. One of um, the one of the um, one of the answer has been proposed by some to, uh, but this is even more utopian in a way. But I guess uh, to synchronize national elections. To synchronize national elections in, in a way to, uh, for example, uh, Grégoire Mallard, uh, a colleague in Geneva, has, has uh, you know organized a variety of conferences on on that proposal. I don't know. I, I mean, it's a very far-ranging proposal, of course. Uh, but in a way, if one wants to have a transnational politics at the European level, maybe the idea of uh, synchronizing. Um, national politics, in a way, or at least in terms of election, could be one uh, way out of this dilemma. But of course, I understand it, this is this is um, this is an issue. Um, uh, to 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 Philippe, maybe I should have started with with, with that. Uh, so I've said already, eighty percent of uh, of members of par of national parliaments and twenty percent of members of European Parliament. Again, I, I've given some justifications for that. I think the number of MPs should be in, in, indeed, and that has evolved ever since we wrote initially the, the treaty, the proposal is not, I mean, should be bigger than 400, because of course, all of what we expect, all of what we can expect from such a transnational treaty comes from the representation of plurality, plurality of parties, plurality of parliamentary groups from national parliaments. Of course, all the, the original dynamics that can come out of it is how much we are able to represent uh, minorities uh, and how much that gives a new dynamic to uh, transnational politics. So I guess, uh, I guess 600 or 700 would allow for smaller countries to bring national delegations with also representatives of uh, the, 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 the minority. So would populists uh, like or dislike the proposal? I think in a way, populists now, we've come to see that they, 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 they have Europeanized themselves. Um, uh, they have found an interest in engaging in transnational politics. And if they see that there is a budget in which they can actually frame in terms of security or in terms of uh, uh, reinforcing walls in um, at the entrance of Europe, all sorts of extreme right-wing um, uh, policy uh, proposals, then I guess they would be happy to get that uh, opportunity. So I, I, I'm not sure, you know, that, that, that was what we say, uh, Joachim, was probably two, 10 years ago. But the way populists have now engaged in transnational politics and in the European Parliament as well, makes me think that they would easily you know, play the rule uh, of of this uh, of this um, of this parliament. But I don't want to be too long. So, uh, and I'm sorry if I don't, didn't understand or uh, didn't answer all the questions. Merci. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, yeah, we are moving fast toward the, the the end of the seminar. So we have another round of questions. We group them by three. So in this order: first, Adrienne, then uh, Calypso, and finally Anya, and then go back to the other side of the table. Uh, Adrienne. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Antoine. I very much agree with you with your overall analysis that with the economic governance, Eurozone crisis governance, uh, there has been this kind of executive centralization tendency at the supranational level and also at the national level to some extent. And therefore, there should be what you said at the beginning, bring back a representative politics in a way. And in the direction in which you think now with this transnational assembly, I think is an important direction in which to, uh, to think but the problems have been now uh, discussed and highlighted in the past recent discussion here. And I also see this problem of micro incentives of uh, parliamentarians which are elected at the national level, but this issue has already been raised. So I would like to raise a second question, which uh, where you talk about these new budgets, which can be formed for public investments, for public goods. And I think this is an interesting idea but I would like to hear more. What is your idea about why would then other member states be incentivized to join these budgets? You must have some mechanism which makes it attractive for them. That's the first point. And the second point is uh, how do these new kind of budgets then would link to your overall design of this transnational uh, kind of assembly? And um, how, how could you avoid a certain fragmentation given that there would be uh, budgets of individual uh, groups of member states kind of thinking about to, how to invest in public goods? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrienne. Calypso. Um, yes, wonderful to see you, Antoine, um, right here with us, physically, kind of, um, and, and, and a pleasure to continue the conversation since I had the you know, honor of being part of that edited book that Philippe was mentioning, and uh, this has been a conversation, like for many of us. So, I, I mean, I do have two questions. One is about, you know, can you say more about how the members of the national parliaments would be chosen and whether, in fact, you couldn't there take in some of what Joachim's fascinating, you know, proposal uh, could be. That there, it's a kind of a, it's, in fact, it's incumbent on national parliaments themselves changing somewhat for, for this to work. Um, I, I, for one, would, would really not put any energy into this idea of synchronization. It's an old hat, we've been discussing it forever. It's not just that it's not feasible, I don't even think it's desirable, it's too centralizing. But okay, so there's this one question about national parliaments. And the second is more important to me these days. I mean, in this very forum we, with Philip and, 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 and all others, we've been discussing, you know, what's going on now with the Conference on the Future of Europe where the opposition is not just between executive and parliaments. And by the way, both of those are part of representative democracy, but in different ways. So I'm not sure why you reserve the term representative to the parliaments. So it's parliamentary versus executive, I would say. But of course, we do live in a new era these days where the kind of the contrast that is drawn is between representative democracy overall, executives plus parliament versus participatory democracy. And that's where my question lies, you know, couldn't we, because of we are a few years later, because there's a conference on the future of Europe, amend your proposal to take in um, all of these new thinking on participatory democracy. You know, I, for one, um, argued here that with the European Recovery Fund, it, we shouldn't say, you know, no taxation without representation. We should say no taxation without participation um, in various ways. And, and so concretely, I wonder if your plenary shouldn't, in, should, sorry, your assembly shouldn't be a bit like the plenary of, not, not the same, but you know, what we've been discussing intensely in the last few weeks, the plenary of the Conference on the Future of Europe, representing not just national parliament, European parliament, but also, you know, region cities, um, rep, uh, delegates of citizens panels, etc. Shouldn't it be more open even than what you suggest? Thank you, Calypso. Uh, Anya. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Antoine, for, for this uh, very interesting proposal. I'm, um, I'm, I, I share your concern about institutional engineering, and you said, well, uh, we should bring together institutional engineering and policies. And I'm a bit uh, concerned about um, bringing together institutional engineering and, and active sociology. And I'm afraid, I'm, I'm not so much afraid about politicization processes, which such a parliament could induce but rather afraid that we would create a sort of dysfunctional parliament, which would actually um, take a lot of attention and empowerment from, from the only strong parliamentary institution that we have created in the European Union so far, which is the European Parliament. And I think um, that actually such a parliamentary um, assembly would create as even an even stronger executive federalism as uh, like the German uh, MPs like uh, to call it. First, because of something that Calypso and, and I think somebody else already said, because indeed national parliaments are for good reasons dominated by executives. So we would have the same thing in, uh, in this parliamentary assembly. And then uh, national parliaments actually fulfill quite different functions in the different parliamentary systems. and. Uh, and, and MPs see their role for democracy in a very different way in different parliaments. And we can see that when we have a look at the creation processes of the interparliamentary assemblies that we already have, because they have big difficulties to come up with, uh, with rules of procedure, they are very slow in, in coming together, and they are often not really used as parliamentary assemblies by the MPs, but just as fora for connecting, uh, for, for discussing things but not really as parliamentary fora. And I think in order to get uh, a strong political institution, which is really used by national MPs with such a variety of different, uh, of different roles, we, we would need a lot of time, a decade. And uh, in this time, we would give a lot of arguments to executives actually to tell their national MPs, well, we have this very nice parliamentary assembly. You do not need to be strengthened on the domestic level, or we do not need to strengthen the European Parliament. Thank you, Anya. Uh, so now maybe we can go back to the other side of the table in inverse order. So we can take maybe first uh, Joachim, then Siana, and then finally back to uh, Antoine. If you manage to stay in maximum three minutes each, we get nicely to the end of the seminar. If you take less time, you can maybe try to uh, get some other inputs and questions to the discussion. So first, uh, Joachim. And of course, feel free to in include in your reaction also what uh, Philip has suggested to, to also have a little discussion or just a couple of thoughts about so the transnational lists. Thank you again, Joachim. Yeah. Okay, indeed, I would like to, to start with a comment on this idea of transnationalists um, in the election of the European Parliament. I'm um, clearly in favor of, uh, of um, providing also a, a kind of a, a dual logic in, uh, in the European Parliament that uh, some uh, representatives are elected on a national basis in a way and some are elected on, um, yeah, uh, um, um, European basis on in a on a transnational constituency uh, level, but I'm concerned with the idea. Of what makes what concerns me is is the term transnationalists. Um, in the book of White and Ippi on 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 parties, yeah, the normative book on parties, they uh, discussed the transnationalization of parties as a kind of a contribution to make uh, the parties even weaker uh, than they already are. Um, because they are, have, are, have no roots there, and if the, these, uh, these federalizations uh, that are uh, taking place uh, when they have to work together on the, on the transnational or supranational level, makes it even less uh, uh, important. And for me, the main concern or the main drive of my approach is uh, that I'm very much concerned with intermediary organizations. I don't, dare, I don't care much about the debate on the European demoi demos. It's more about uh, the, the inter what links people and uh, the government. It's the intermediary organizations and I have strong doubts whether on the European level, on the supranational level, um, um, the intermediary organizations, parties, media and interest groups works in a halfway similar way uh, uh, like they could wor uh, do work on the national level 
yeah, for, for me, it's a national level where I see the most important uh, ways of, of thinking about trans uh, democratizing uh, the European multi-level system. Okay, thank you, uh, Joachim. Uh, Sijana. Um, I will also just briefly react to Felipe's proposal um, and then leave the, the rest of the time for, for the other discussions. Um, but I really think that the idea of EU constituency list, list is, really has an immense potential and would be probably my most preferred option for uh, democratizing the European Union. Um, only in this way we could introduce truly transnational representation along political, functional, instead of um, territorial lines. And the first steps in that direction have already been taken by the introduction of the Spitzenkandidaten um, during the um, EP election, um, etc. But I think that still the most important step hasn't been taken, which be the uh, gradual empower empowerment of transnational political parties. The whole, um, the, the emphasis now falls on the transnational political groups within the European Parliament, whereas the, the transnational political parties are just umbrella organizations without uh, uh, much power and influence. And I think that we should actually start there before introducing the, the, constituent, the EU constituency lists, we should empower transnational political parties. Thank you, Siyana. You are all being uh, very short and concise in your answers. I thank you for this. So now Antoine, and if somebody else in the meantime wants to maybe jump in for a lot latest, for the for last comment, just raise your hand and see if we have time afterwards. Antoine. Merci. Uh, we, uh, so on, uh, on the transnational list, I think I, I, um, I agree with uh, Siana. I think it's, it's, it's certainly an interesting proposal, but how can it be really enough to, transnational, to transnationalize political party? Uh, we were talking about incentives earlier. I mean, is, is, it, is it enough, an incentive to uh, really um, uh, create this hinge between European uh, politics and uh, national politics, uh, and uh, and to to um, to push national parties to um, really to 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 really be interesting in continuously framing national issues also as European issues and um no, i don't I, I don't think so so in a way i think it's it's an interesting idea but 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 uh, but probably uh it's 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 probably doesn't really um trigger the dynamic that it, it hopes to be triggering i think um then uh, just on a more concrete uh uh question on how would I think it's Calypso, but others also raised the point. Uh, I think Philippe also. How would this these MPs uh, sent to this transnational parliament be chosen? And I think this um, this uh, could be organized through a sort of general rule that uh, the composition of the delegation of the national delegation should be built in proportion of the uh, the weight of the different uh, parliamentary groups and so in in a way to somehow harmonize uh, the way in which uh, these MPs would be would be chosen i think that otherwise the the very idea of the of the of the assembly would be somehow betrayed so that's very important um again on 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 calypso um so should we in in a way Yes, should we should we change should we, should 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 it be a parliament not only of representatives but also a parliament uh, of um, um, I don't know uh, citizens that would be chosen uh, randomly or other forms of uh, participation uh, today? I'm not I'm not sure. I think I, um, I think it's 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 probably a different a different uh, project. Um, I'm not saying that this parliament uh, shouldn't be also composed maybe of uh, regional parliaments of all the forms of representation. I think Paul Magnette in discussing the TEDEM was making this proposal that it wouldn't be 
that in a way was too French in its way of conceiving representation uh, as national, uh, but it should also include other forms of representation of representative politics, uh, particularly uh, regional. And I think it's probably fair to say so. I think though, there's something, I mean, I remember the way uh, Nancy Fraser frames the issue of public space. She, she, she says there are, there are strong publics and, and weak publics and the strong publics are these institutions that uh, where deliberation happens and there are somehow lodged at the core of the state and are there to somehow wait on the decision. And these are parliaments basically, um, parties and representatives. And they're the weak publics in a way, which are more the social movements, um, probably the NGOs and a variety of uh, organized or unorganized civil society. And the issue is, of course, that the, the, the weak public needs also the strong public. Uh, if there is no uh, uh, capacity to really wait on public decision, such as a parliament can do, uh, particularly a permanent institution uh, uh, as a, such a parliament, uh, then the weak public, you know, has very little uh, um, uh, entry points into the state or into the into the European Union, for that matter. So uh, I think the idea is more, it would be more to think about ways to articulate than uh, ways to blend the two uh, uh, the two uh, types of democracy in a way. But I mean, of course, this is just a matter of discussion. Uh, and um, uh, since I'm in Florence, I will hope we'll. We'll continue this discussion, Calypso, and with all of you, of course. Okay, uh, thank you, Antoine. Indeed, uh, there will be plenty of occasions to, to keep uh, the discussion going. And we're now very close to 2 p.m., so I think we can wrap things up towards the end of this very engaging and, and stimulating discussion. I would like to thank again uh, the panelists and all the participants from the audience. Now for the regular EGPP seminar series, we convene at the end of May, actually on May 26, with a research seminar titled The Adoption of the Use COVID Recovery Plan, Policy Shift, Legal Engineering and Institutional Transformation, actually with a question mark. And Bruno De Vitte will be uh, our speaker. But before that, we have one more conversation taking place actually next week. And on this note, I leave uh, again the floor to Philippe uh, for some concluding remarks and for giving us a preview of the next conversation taking place, as I said, next week. So thank you again to everyone. and. Philip, the final floor is yours. Yeah, um, it's not going to be a synthesis of what has been said. I, I just want to say this is really a good example of what we want to promote. That is, uh, we have a, a, a bold proposal, a, a clear proposal that's uh, with, with a, a, a sort of serious uh, uh, background in terms of arguments and analysis of uh, the problems, but uh, it uh, raises itself a number of difficulties that have uh, to come out in a frank way, be discussed. Uh, some of them can be answered, some, for some of them it's more difficult to answer them. And uh, so I appreciate in particular the very systematic way in which Siana formulated her, her, um, uh, her objections and the, the difficulties. And many of them uh, Antoine must have heard uh, before, but uh, I, I thought they were they were formulated in a particularly uh, lucid way in the light of uh, no doubt her, her own research. And so this is really the sort of dialogue uh, we uh, want uh, to foster. We'll do the same uh, next week. Uh, so uh, on the uh, same time, so and same day of the week. Uh, uh, so it will, then the discussion will be introduced by uh, Miguel Maduro. So who was until recently the director of the School of Transnational Governments at uh, EUI, as many of you know, he was also a member of the Portuguese government at some point. Now he's back uh, in uh, Portugal and uh, teaches uh, at uh, the Catholic University of uh, Portugal. He still keeps a connection with uh, EUI. One of his uh, pet ideas uh, for quite a few years has been that the EU needs to um, amplify its own resources, so we'll be back to that topic. We asked him to talk about uh, for an update on that. So, and uh, he, he proposed as a title um, uh, EU taxes and how that can increase citizen support for the European Union. Uh, the discussions will be uh, Matthias Kuhn, 
with uh, at NYU and at the Wissenschaftszentrum in Berlin, and Jakob Kapelle, who is at the universities of du uh, uh, Duisburg, Essen, and, and in uh, uh, the University of Linz in, uh, in Austria. And I think uh, uh, Daniele Caramani, who's been sort of uh, overseeing uh, this operation, will say a few words also next week. And, uh, and so will, I think, uh, Brigitte Laffan, who, as I mentioned before, was also at the origin of uh, this whole initiative. So thank you very much to um, our three uh, speakers, uh, to Lorenzo as uh, usual, to Martina and uh, to uh, Sarah for all the organization and see you next week.